Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast. Today is Monday, July 20th, 2020. Today's podcast is the third in our mini series on when bad things happen in pregnancy, and it is titled Time with a Time. In this podcast, I speak with two remarkable women, Simi Hersko and Yehuda Grinwald, who are part of an amazing organization called A Time. As you will hear, this organization was created to support families with infertility and has grown over the years to now be a resource for families with pregnancy loss, high-risk pregnancies, adoption, mental health, pretty much anything. One of the themes you will hear is how when they started, many of these topics were not spoken about. And fortunately, this has changed over the years. They, and a time, are one of the reasons. On Thursday, we will have our final podcast in the miniseries on critical care for pregnant women. For now, enjoy time with a time. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Okay, so I'm here with Simi Hersko and Hudis Greenwald from A-Time. Thank you guys for coming on. Welcome to the Healthful Woman podcast. Thank you, and it's our honor to be here. And thank you for all that you do to all your patients. You know, every time we reach out to you in a crisis, you guys are always here for us. So I want to thank you for that as well. My name is Yehudis Greenwald, and I am the liaison to Rabbi Unger. That is the Rav and Rabbinical Advisory of A-Time. My role in in being Rabbi Agner's secretary is a lot of times people come out of their appointments and they have questions, questions, halakha questions pertaining to pregnancy, pertaining to different questions that come up when they feel like they need to have rabbinic advice. So I'm usually the person that takes the intake call. I try to get all the information, medical information, so, you know, Rabbi Agner can answer their questions. Sometimes the patient doesn't even know what questions or what medical re- records we need, or, you know, sometimes it'll be us, and you know, going to the doctors, asking the doctor specific questions that Rabbi Unger needs to know in order to be able to give advice. Rabbi Unger is very medically knowledgeable, but yet he, you know, always relies on the doctors and the doctor's opinions. And we're really here as a advocate for the patient so they understand, so we can explain things, sometimes in layman terms. And then we also offer a lot of support for whatever the couple's going through if there is a crisis in the pregnancy. Simi, you're up. Hi, uh, my name is Simi Hershko, and I do some medical referrals on the helpline. So generally, people will call into the helpline when they have a question regarding anything fertility related, or sometimes people will call when they come out of a doctor and they hear that something is wrong or that they have to do this procedure or that procedure or they find themselves in a situation where they don't know what to do. They will call in and I pick up the phone like three to four times a week, sometimes at night. And I try to refer them to the best possible referral I can. Yeah, basically that's what I do. So, and you guys mentioned so many things that you guys do in so many roles and just For me to take a step back, so a lot of the people listening will know who A Time is and what you guys do. And for those who don't know, you know, A Time is a is an organization. It's a nonprofit organization that is essentially has has many roles, and we're going to talk about that. But you know, you just heard some of them now about you know people who have need help finding the right doctor, or they don't understand, you know, maybe from a, a Jewish religious perspective, what they can and can't do, what they should and shouldn't do. And there's a lot of support, you know, and then advice and whatnot. When did A-Time start? Like what what start what started it? How did it start? What's the story of A-Time, basically? So I've been with A-Time, I would say, over 20 years. So A-Time has been founded by Mrs. Bronnie Rosen. Primarily, it started out as an infertility organization. It was a support to couples experiencing infertility guidance. They tried doing medical guidance. At that point, you know, everything was the unspoken. It was very difficult for couples. So it started out primarily as an infertility organization. As the organization grew and a lot of our infertility patients at that point, you know, we're starting to do IVF. IVF was new about 20, 22 years ago. Couples got pregnant with multiples. A lot of them ended up with high-risk pregnancies. So as there was a need, that's how the organization grew into many different things. You know, we branched out to many different services that we have, and we grew as there was a need. Infertility, adoption, at this point, we're teaching. Rabbi Unger has a whole Machon, that's like a, almost like a, a seminar uh, where he teaches and educates Rabbanim, 
rabbis medic- with medical, they should understand medical terms, medical procedures. So they're, when people reach out to them, they're more knowledgeable and they can guide their couples. We have, like I said, adoption. We have support pregnancy loss. You know, sometimes people get the question of termination. Termination does come up. You know, and um, a, lot. a lot of more than uh, right, thing. right, and a lot of rabbis. You know, originally going back, I would say, 15, 16 years ago, when you told a couple that this, you know, this is a case where it needs a termination, the rabbi would totally say, "Oh, we don't do termination." You know, the more educated they got, the more they were able to be more open-minded to whatever's best for the couple, whatever's best for the mother. Right. I think what you know what you're speaking about. There's so many things that are so important, and you know, one of them is when you're talking about when eight times started and regarding infertility, how at the time in, you know, in the Orthodox Jewish community, it really wasn't spoken about. It was almost like, like it was shameful that if someone, you know, is, you know, married and trying to have kids and they can't, that there's somehow, you know, that there's some, they're flawed, there's something wrong with them. And everyone who was going through infertility or sort of on the, on the medical side knew is how common it was. It's not, and, and, but no one spoke about it. So everyone thought they were the only people going through this. And so, When an organization steps up and says, no, no, like people go through this, you're allowed to go through this, we're going to help you go through this, and you'll come out on the other end, it opens up a whole world for people in terms of their families, but also just emotionally that they don't feel like they're alone anymore. A hundred percent. It was unspoken. Everything was unspoken. And I just, the other day I had a girl who called me, she, we were reminiscing over the past and she's like, she remembers when they were married seven years and an eight time called her and asked her if she would speak to some of the other couples. And she remembers herself saying, but if I speak, then people will know that I don't have children. But as we were doing the services and people started joining support groups, we have most probably 20 different types of support groups running today for all different types of issues and awareness, a lot of awareness. And I think that's like Dr. Fox said. The awareness and the bringing it out of the closet is huge. And there's awareness, like you said, first for for the families going through this. And then the aspect you mentioned for rabbis, you know, in, in the community, many people, if not all people, the, the first person they're going to turn to maybe after their parents would be their rabbi. And rabbis get to the position they're at for being excellent at certain things. And medicine is not mm-hmm. one of the things required to, to, to get that stature. But people start asking the questions and they relate you know, to medicine and what should I do and advice. And on the positive side, it's so fortunate that there are rabbis like Rabbi Unger and others who who have so much knowledge about it and not just have the knowledge, but seek knowledge. They want to know more so they can advise people and help people accordingly. But it's also unfortunate that sometimes there are people who are asked questions and they don't know. They don't know what they're talking about. They're like, well, what do you mean? They don't understand it. And you know, sometimes I get calls from rabbis asking me like, hey, like, what is, what are they talking about? How do I help them? And, you know, others, unfortunately, maybe even give advice without understanding what, what goes into these types of decisions. And that's a real communal effort to improve and increase the education amongst everybody about what we're talking about so people can make the right decisions. I still remember when I actually got to know about a time and it was very funny because we were married for like three years and we didn't have kids yet. And one of my husband's friends was also in the same situation. He's married for a little bit of a longer time. And he was like, oh, Adon is making a weekend, like, Shabbaton. It's like, it's beautiful. Like, really, you guys should come. And I was like, me? Nah, I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know. I was, we were not so excited about, I was not so excited about going. And then my husband's like, you know what? Why shouldn't we try? And I was like, come from you? Okay. If you think so, <laughs> <laughs> You know, usually the guys are the ones who don't want to go. And I was like, okay, you know what? You want to try? Let's go. So we were driving out. It was like two hours before Shabbos started. And we arrived to the hotel and we looked at each other and I'm like, man, we're going home. Like, how much do we still have time? How much time do we still have to go home? And I'm like, you know what? Okay, let's just go through the door. And once we went into those doors, it was like, it was like going into a different land, a different world. It was just so, so beautiful and inspiring. And the entire weekend, the entire shop, there were people talking and the food and the ambiance and getting to know more people who were sort of like in the same situation. And yeah, every single, I'm saying, it, just like in every other thing in life, and fertility has, I would say, I wouldn't pull it steps. It's just like every couple is in a different place medically and emotionally and True, there are people at the Shabbaton who didn't even do IVF, and then there are those who can't do IVF because IVF won't work for them. 
for people who need to do IVF in addition to other stuff. So there's a very big criteria of people, but knowing that you're not alone and that you're not the only one, only one going through infertility and feeling, especially in our community where most people do have large families and most people do, I mean, since there's a big population, there's going to be a bigger chance of people having kids right away than not having kids right away. So it is a little hard. But knowing that there were people that were there to support you and guide you, it was it was really amazing. Right, and also just knowing so that you're not the only ones. Away. Yeah, that you're not That's the only correct. ones. Yeah. You're like all the, I mean, all these people are here. They're they're going through maybe not the exact same thing I'm going through, but something similar. Right. And like, wow, right. this is this is real. Correct. It's um. Yeah. So that's sort of how it started. And obviously, at that time, you know, so you're talking about the this is like the mid '90s. When it started, you know, 94, 95, 96, there was a lot of IVF. It was was definitely happening. It was in full swing and was such an important aspect. And as you said, it really, it expanded that eight times. So now you have all these, you know, families and trying to figure out what to do. You know, many people with fertility struggles, there's nothing wrong with them. They just, for whatever reason, it's unexplained. But a lot of the people who are going through this do have also complicated medical problems or they're older or they have unique genetic situations or whatever it is. Right. And now and now that they're getting pregnant, it opens up a whole new world of the same thing, whether it's stigma, whether it's support, whether it's education. And so you guys took that on as well. And so you grew. And it's and I think that's amazing. Yeah, well, you know what? Automatically, if people are, are having infertility questions, once the infertility part is over, they and they will become pregnant, we're going to have a lot of a host of a lot more issues like multiple pregnancies and complications during pregnancies. And as you have pregnancy loss, unfortunately, right. Stillbirths, unfortunately. And also you also have to realize that this couple's made a very close connection to us and they trust us. We've been holding their hand from the beginning of the journey. And always, we always hope that, you know, once they get pregnant, they do move on and we only hear good news from them. But unfortunately, some of them need to reach out to us again. And we're there for them. We try to be there from beginning to end to them, whatever their need is. And when you say we in terms of support, like, is that, you know, is it just a friendly person on the phone or is it, and is obviously there's, there's, you know, rabbis and are there, are there counselors? Like so in terms of your like professional staff who would be interacting with, with, you know, with families, not on an administrative level, but sort of in that support level, what, what kind of services do you have or what kind of you know, people do you have on in your in your team that help them? We have Rebecca Koenig and Mrs. Moskowitz, Brani Rosen. We have a lot of very medically knowledgeable people. Sometimes we'll feel like when they reach out to us, even with, let's say, a situation that comes up in a pregnancy or there's a crisis, we sometimes will get the medical records. We'll try to send it to doctors. We refer them to another doctor for another opinion. Let's get the scan. We, we try to get a clearer picture of what's going on. And as you know, we reach out to the doctor sometimes and say, you know, the couple's very overwhelmed. They don't understand. Can we? So we're there for them. We try to do get medical guidance for them. We try to get emotional and mental support. Uh, we have a lot of therapists, licensed psychologists, psychiatrists on board, you know, that are part of our organization and they volunteer and some of them volunteer and then we move them on if they need to help um you know, for further help, they will see a therapist. Rabbinic advice. Sometimes it's it's crazy because sometimes we'll just pick up a couple in the crisis and we'll offer them a getaway for a weekend because we feel that's what they need. So we're really, we have a lot of special services, but, but our goal is to fill the need, whatever this couple needs. And it's every couple individual, the couple needs therapy. We have in the past even needed to come up with money to help people pay for therapy. Of course, we're, we're not an, an organization that can help people financially because we're more there for emotional, physical, mental support. But when there's a need, we'll try to get an organization, even that's out of our umbrella, to kick in for this couple. Sometimes they need help in the house. Whatever that couple's going through, when we feel we could fill that need, we try to be there for them. But yeah, we do have professional therapists. We have Robinick, of course, like I said, and then we have a lot of volunteers on our helpline, and we're really there to just hold their hands. We have volunteers that are constantly taking phone calls. They have a question. They come, you know, they came out of the doctor's office and they don't understand what the doctor said. And sometimes they're just too overwhelmed, and we try to explain to them. The first thing we do is we calm them down, and uh, we have a few different helplines running. We have helplines for pregnancy loss. We have helplines for stillbirths. We have helplines for people, po young people post hysterectomy. We do events for the people, everybody geared to their own, to whatever they're experiencing. Constant phone support, sometimes in 
group, support groups, you know, whatever is really needed for the, you know, when we have different divisions, like I said, infertility, secondary infertility, pregnancy loss, stillbirth, post hysterectomy, adoption, everybody in their, uh, where they secondary are. Secondary infertility. Second, oh, correct. Primary. How much of what you do, I know you mentioned about like someone who, you know, needs therapy and they can't afford it, you try to help. How much of your organization is spent trying to, you know, actually help people financially with these services? Is that is that a, a very small portion? It's, it's zero. It's it's a significant portion. And I mean, obviously, there's the support aspect in terms of like, you know, emotional support and sort of uh, logistical support. But how much of it is financial support for couples? So what we really do is we try to get there are many organizations in different states and different towns that are geared to help with people with, you know, that need financial help for whatever it, it is, you know, like even I'll give it like a burial, you know, burial people don't realize when there's a stillbirth and then you need to do burial, burial costs a lot of money. So we actually don't, don't do that, but we work very closely with the burial organizations that we're here to guide them and to help them. There are organizations that will pay for people to get professional help. Right. You know, so, and so we advocate for the couple and we are in touch with a lot of different organizations that kick in and the couple himself doesn't even know there's, you know, there's an organization based out of Brooklyn for mothers of children who have heart conditions. We will connect them. We work with them. We try to we try to get the couple whatever help they need. So when you're talking about financials, no, we are officially not a financial organization that helps for mental health. Right. But we will advocate for them. We will get in touch with them. We'll tell them what the situation is. We'll make sure that the couple is being taken care of. And you also do advocacy not just for them, but you sort of advocate on a on a more on a, on a higher level, I know that because, you know, a times is a lot of people and a lot of very well-respected and important people who, you know, are there full-time and who volunteer. And I know that you guys have, you know, lobbied in terms of, you know, insurance companies and, you know, government about things that should be covered and, and whatnot. And you, and you definitely, you, you lend a voice to, for your community to represent them in these discussions. So we actually have uh, Mr. Newstead, who is an insurance advocacy. He's trained, he spent every single day of how he can advocate um, for our patients. He works with insurance companies. He's a paid worker. He works full-time for a time, and that's what he does, literally advocating for our couples so they can get their insurance, get their insurance right. Sometimes patients get denied certain things of insurance companies, and they end up with huge bills not knowing that they were going into this. I once had where we went into the hospital to have a procedure done, and we didn't know that it needed to be pre-certified. The hospital hadn't called us to ask for our insurance, to ask for pre-certification. And I don't know, we arrived to the hospital and they're like, we walk in and they're like, okay, you have to pay us $5,000. And we're like, what? what What are you talking about? They're like, oh, you weren't pre-certified. I was like, how was I supposed to know I needed to be pre-certified? So bottom line, we put the money down, we swiped our card. And then after the procedure was done, we actually called a time and we're like, is there anything that we can do about that? And they got us connected with Mr. Neustadt and he did fight the bill for us. Meaning we did, they did waive the $5,000 because for some reason, either they were supposed to pre-certify it and they didn't let us know, but whatever it was, he was able to fight it. So that's a lot what he does too. And it's such an important role. I mean, people, I shouldn't say we forget because everybody knows that, you know, healthcare is so complicated and, you know, how to pay for things and insurance and, you know, regular, you know, whatever commercial insurance and Medicaid, there's so many aspects that are so complicated and no one understands it. It's so, it's so difficult. And to sort of have to sort through that while you're sorting through, whether it's an illness or a complicated pregnancy or infertility, and it just compounds it and makes it so much worse. And to have, you know, people who are there to help you with that is, you know, critical. Some people are lucky enough that they have a, a brother who's good at it or their parent is good at it or, you know, whatever. They they happen to know someone who knows how to work systems and figure this out. But most people don't. Most of us are just like, huh? Like, what do I do? And it's it's really critical. It's, it's you know, it's a huge piece of this. Correct. We, we have had situations where I'm sure you heard about Tala, which is a, you know, Jewish uh, ambulance Volunteer. service, right? And they sometimes have patients that they're transporting from the Catskill Mountains to New York City, or they get stuck in a hospital in New Jersey, and, and you know, it's an emergency, and we realize this woman is either going to give birth someplace, and is she covered, is she not covered? And they will sometimes reach out to us and say, listen, this is a situation, but we have an emergency. What do we do? And we, at this point, are enough knowledgeable to tell them it's an emergency. Every hospital will take you. Don't worry. We'll deal with, we'll deal with whatever we need to deal with. 
later. We'll try to contact the doctor. I mean, sometimes these questions come up regarding assurance and they don't know, but they'll reach out to us. So we make sure that care is not compromised. Do you have a, a physical space? Like, is there like a, like an office that people sit in and work in? Or is it just everyone like sort of volunteering on their cell phones? Yeah, we have two beautiful offices. One is based out of Williamsburg and one is based out of Bar Park. And we have quite a few employees sitting there every single day. How many people, give or take, are full-time or working there every day versus how many people are volunteering? So in the Williamsburg office, we have three women and three men working there every single day. Travel from Monty to Brooklyn also to be there twice a week. In the Bar Park office, which is the original office, we have way more people. Mm -hmm. We have, I would say, about full-time employees. Simi, am I correct by saying 12? Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm 12 or 13. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Wow. That are also sit in the office the entire day, literally from nine to five. Right. And then you have obviously, as you said, people who also volunteer their time and are, you know, doing this, not sitting in the office. Right. So a lot, we have a lot of volunteers. We actually have volunteers answering helpline calls. That means that we have volunteers that take intake call. And sometimes it's just a, just a small question that we don't need to get to somebody higher than that. So, and there's also, there's helpline for infertility, <clears throat> primary, secondary, pregnancy laws, high-risk pregnancies. So we have different volunteers just answering. And they always come back to the people who are who know more than them. Usually nobody will answer a question unless it's something that's such a minor question and they really know the answer because they answered the question 10 times today. So they will usually discuss everything with our medical board. And we have a very good medical board. Do you have a sense of how many calls come in a day or a week or a month, give or take? I'm that's just curious. so random because sometimes... I usually work Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. So Mondays, it's usually crazy. And then Tuesdays, sometimes like the volume of calls is lower, but then you know, this phone will not stop ringing. And Vivi is going to be nonstop as you both say the helpline is a little quieter. So it's very, very random. I don't know. I would, I would say that I most, most probably on a regular day, I answer between 80 and 110 calls a day. Right. And you're just one person. Of all these I am people. one person, one person. And I am one person, yeah. So, yeah. The, so the, I yeah. mean, so people are answering the phones all the time, basically. And is it, is it, you know, if you say 80 to 100 calls, is, is that 80 to 100 people or is it eight people who are, you no. know, 10 calls? No, <laughs> right. So it's, it's very hard to say because I get all, every day is different. But I'll say this, if I have a 21-year-old girl who's going through a pregnancy loss, I can have two family members call and then her mother call and then her rabbi call. And then I get into the phone with a doctor. So it's not, I'm not going to tell you that I speak to 110 people a day. Right, right. No, but it's back and forth. I'll wait for reports. I'll, I'll contact this. But I, I sometimes at the end of the day will count on how many incoming calls I had. That's how many incoming calls a day. Cases varies, you know, always different. Sometimes it varies between 30 and 50 cases a day. Wow. I mean, that's, I mean, that's tremendous volume. Yeah, but I, I mean, yeah, but that's always, I also can sometimes send out meaning I'll refer. Let's say if I get this call and I feel like, oh, Simi is the perfect person to speak to, I will email Simi and I say, I have somebody calling you. I think, you know, whatever. We work a lot together. We really, between all of us, this is Bronnie Rosen, Rabbi Rosen, Vivi Moskowitz, Rabbi Koenig, Rabbi Unger, we all work right. together and we right. all, you know, we network, we network, we network the entire day. Right. All my and friends. And even if we'll get a medical condition, <laughs> right. Yeah, all your friends, exactly. All my, all and sometimes, my friends. you know, <laughs> We even if we have a situation and we feel that maybe the right thing is to do this, we usually run it like we'll always just even if we shoot an email and say, you know, I had this situation and this is what and then somebody will say brainstorm. Oh, maybe we send like a chat for whatever reason. I'm just saying there's always different things, but we really network a lot between each other. Right. And so how do people find out about you? Is it just word of mouth because, you know, you're so active in the community or is it or do you have specific outreach programs or is it advertising or, or you know, how do people say, hey, let's call a time? I think a lot of it is word of mouth. Right. I would say 80%, 80%, 80%, 80%, is, 80% is word of mouth. We do but, run a lot of advertising right. in, in the weekly, let's say, the Hami, the Pibaha, or, you know, these types of things. Right. A very big source that we try to address is the rabbis. You know, we're constantly educating rabbis because a lot of, in the, most communities, I would say the first go to person, somebody's in a crisis or something, they will reach out to their rabbi. So if their rabbi is educated and at least knows to send to us, then that's that's networking. And so do you do you ever get calls from people sort of just out of nowhere, either people, you know, they're maybe they're not they're not religious or they're not even Jewish and they just heard about you and they call and and how did and they just they hear about you? We do have people from well, since I wouldn't say we're only based on we're, we're based more than in the tri-state area. We have 
some people working out of Florida. We have people in Maryland. We have people all over in Israel, Canada. So we will get a very big variety of people that we will be dealing with. So that's why I usually, when I start speaking to someone and I start hearing what the, you know, what the situation is and I ask them who their rub is, I'll sometimes, you know, figure out, where, you know, which demograph right. they are from or and then we work accordingly. And, you know, I always tell them that, you know, you know, when someone has a question, like a rabbinical question, let's say, should we terminate? Should we not? Should we do this? Should we not do this? I usually ask them, what kind of rub do you usually speak to? And we'll go according to that, meaning to say, I'll try to find a rub who knows about that according to your demographic, and we'll work from there. Right. To sort of where, where people are in their own community to try to help them on that plane. We do run ads in the local Jewish papers, which is something fairly new. Um, social media, we do on a very, very low scale. You know, unfortunately, we're overwhelmed with callers as is, so we don't feel there's a need to advertise because I also think today, even not even in the state of New York, but we get calls. I normally get at least 10 or 15 international calls a day. And then I get calls just from, you know, from Chicago and from Pennsylvania, from all over. So I think it's pretty much out there. We try to do as much outreach as we can based upon seminars. We go to different communities and um, we try to tell them what we do. Our goal is really that every community in, in the world should have an organization like that or a branch. And that's what we really try to do. They don't have to rely on us. The point is that word needs to get out. Word needs to get out that we're here, we're here, and we want to help. Right. And I think also a lot of the things that you do are always going to be needed, obviously, you know, when, when individual families come to you for help. But some of the things that you do as there becomes more recognition and knowledge and understanding and education, then these things aren't needed as much anymore. So if, you know, once you've taught someone something, then they'll know it. And so I think that a lot of the education is, is just sort of snowballs that more and more people will understand and know. On the one hand, that's good because they won't, you won't have to do it again. But on the other hand, then people realize, oh my God, we have to start asking more questions. <laughs> and so you get, a, right. you know, sometimes that, that increases your volume at the same time. Right. What, 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 are, what would you say, you know, aside from infertility, like right now, what, what, what are the other, let's say, top three things you guys are, are doing on a day, on a daily basis? Like what's the most common types of issues or problems you're trying to solve for people or help them? Solve, Pregnancy loss. Pregnancy loss. Okay. That's very big. That is a very, very big part. What happens is that when someone has, let's say someone comes out of there, the doctor's also going to doctor says there's no heartbeat now, depending on at which stage they're in. They're like, okay, who's doing the DNC for us? Apparently not all doctors do DNC. Do we need to bury the baby? How do we bury the baby? Who takes care of that? Most people are very, very lost. I remember being very, very lost when we were having our office and just knowing that there's someone to talk to, that was amazing. And they, they told us what to do, where to go, how to go about with it. Right. So and, I it, would and it's everything. It's, it's, it's not just, it's, it's sort of like religious support and medical support. It's both, right? It's, it's, so you're sort of talking about both aspects and emotional support, obviously. And right. It, but it, I have it. to say between all the calls that I man a day, not even, I wouldn't say that it's, I would say that we have at least 50% of it is high risk questions, high risk of sexual questions, you know, people needing explanation, support, um, loss and, and infertility. I Meaning it's not that 80% of our calls are infertility. And we, I would say at least half of it would be obstetrical. It's so interesting because, you know, I know that from my perspective as a OB, as a high risk OB, our office and your office are in contact all the time. I mean, we're, you right. know, we're, we're speaking right. a lot. And it's so interesting because so much of it is, it's just unfortunate because so many people they'll they'll see a doctor and you know he or she will tell them something and either it's that they didn't do a great job explaining it or it's something they couldn't understand and then it's sort of like what do we do and it's this big it's like an emergency because it's you hear bad news or it might be bad news and so then you know we'll get a call you know or an email from usually one of you two <laughs> saying you know can you can you see this person and it's it's obviously our pleasure. Some of it is unfortunate because a lot of the things that we do see probably didn't have to come our way if they were sort of, you know, uh, addressed better originally. But then at that point, the couple sort of loses trust in that first doctor, yeah. you know, even if it's, and again, they could have, it's possible they explained it well, and the, it just wasn't the right time to hear it. It's possible they didn't explain it so well. 
And so a lot of the stuff, you know, we're, we're, and we're trying to triage. Or sometimes it's misinterpreted. You know? Right, obviously. And it's, By it's, the patient. Yeah, no, I think that a lot of times they're very overwhelmed and they can't yeah. even listen to what the doctor's saying. They thought they're coming in and they're seeing an ultrasound of a heartbeat and all of a sudden their world in a half a second came crashing down on right. them. So they're so overwhelmed they can't even hear what the doctor has to say. So I think that by us stepping in and where we can hear bits and pieces, we usually know already what's going on and we could calm them down. And then we can explain to them the question because they're not calling the doctor 10 times with all their questions. I would have an interesting question to you, Dr. Fox. Oh, here we go. Do you feel or do you see a difference with, um, with, with a patient that has support and I'm talking about all type of support and a couple that have not comes in with no support. And when I'm talking about support, it could be rabbinic support. It could be organizational support. Do you feel like, what is your experience on the other side? So that's a great question. Uh, I would say it's different in many ways. The first is the ones with support. I'll have uh, you guys emailing me all the time and not, uh, not the other person. <laughs> There's two different things. I think number one, I think I and the people I work with have worked with you guys for a long time. And one of the things that's really good on our end when people come through a time is we sort of get everything set up right. We, we understand the story before it happens. So I'll know before someone comes in, okay, this is what happened. This is her story. She saw this doctor. I'll get a copy of this ultrasound report. Here's what they said. Here's her question. Here's her concern. And so when, when the, you know, the couple walks into my office, I'm ready. And I can talk to Although them. Although I'll, I'll interrupt you a second. Yep. And I'll say, how many times do we think we're getting the picture <laughs> and we give you? And then, oh, my God, this is so not the story. And uh, okay. we like, <laughs> that happens. You, you were know. told by Dr. A. So we forward it to you. And, oh, my God, it was so not the story. And we feel terrible. But we come. We give you the information we get. Right. So, you know, I, I, I yeah, say, I'm sorry yeah. I interrupted. I just <laughs> needed to put that out there. No, I, I'd, say, I'd say there's probably there's two sort of stories that happen, you know, for, for patients who come to us through a time, usually it's one of two things. Either the first thing is there's a, a, a real situation going on. Either there's a, a significant, you know, concern over the baby or the mother has a real particular issue, whether it's medical or whatever. And, and, and so we come in and we sort of help manage that and help them through the pregnancy. That's sort of like the high risk piece. And the mm -hmm. second piece is sort of the opposite. It's they think there's a big problem, but there isn't, and they need someone to tell them that. And so <laughs> to just say like, you know, actually you're okay. This is not, you know, something to worry about. Here's why, here's all you need to do. And some of those patients come to us once and never come back, but most of them tend to stay because they just feel comfortable with the people who told Correct. them that everything is okay. And you know, obviously either Correct. one is fine. And so, but I do think that the other, the, the nice aspect is particularly many of the patients who come through, you know, after we meet with them or I meet with them, they usually want me to sort of follow up with you guys in some capacity, whether it's to you guys or whether it's to Rabbi Unger. And, and the nice thing about it and how I've been so impressed, you know, with Rabbi Unger is when we speak, you know, he, he's a rabbi, I'm a doctor, you know, we grew up in different places, different worlds, we do different things every day, but the conversations that we have are so, they're on such a, like a high level. And I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to spend all my time explaining to him what this is, what this is, what this is. Like he gets it, he understands. And we're really talking about the details of it. And it's it's not much different from if I called up a high-risk doctor and say, hey, what do you think about this? And so to have that expertise in a rabbi who understands the medical concepts, you know, he's not a doctor, he's in, you know, not 100%, but he's in such a, a level, he's, it's, we're able to talk about it in a real way. And so many of my other conversations are not that. It's just me trying to help them understand just what the situation is. And it takes, they just can't, they can't possibly help the couple because they don't understand. They're not educated in that way. And that, you know, he, he's sort of devoted his career, so to speak, or his life into, you know, helping people in this aspect. So he's an expert in it. And it's really, it's great. And it's a real benefit to the people who go through you through a time to have that sort of expertise, helping guide them. And also just the fact that, as you said, you guys take so many calls, you've seen everything, you, you've heard of everything, you know, things don't surprise you or shock you in the same way that it made others. And you just, you know, you hear it, you listen and you move on, you know, here's what you need. How do you even decide where to go with these things? And when you said, oh, maybe we'll send them to CHOP, maybe we'll do this. Is it just based on your experience or is it, I know you've developed relationships with various, you know, not various, but many, you know, doctors, you know, around the country, around the world, but how do you even approach those sometimes it's just amazing because i get a phone call and as the as the patient is talking to me i'm like thinking okay where are we going with this you know 
And I, I don't want to say for some odd reason, because it's not for some odd reason, but then a thought just comes into your head and you say, and I could say that I've not dealt, let's say, with a specialist in, in a CHOP or in Boston or whoever it is, and for some reason, based upon based upon hearing what the patient says, and sometimes it could be medical, and sometimes you also take into consideration where this couple's coming from. Is this doable? Is this not doable? What capacity do they have to go out of state? Is it an option to them? Is it not an option to them? Is insurance, you know, everything comes into play. It's not, it's a very rounded decision. It's not only, um, okay, medically the best place for them really to go to Boston to do whatever procedure they need to do for this unborn fetus, but sometimes well, as we talk, we start seeing what the options are and we give them the best option that's for them, particularly in that case. And like I said, we do discuss it. We discuss it with our medical board. We discuss it with Rabbi Unger to make sure that every piece, and I think also experience is definitely because usually we'll have, okay, I dealt with a situation last time, did not go well. So for sure, we're not taking that route, but we'll take that route. And you know, we we consult with you doctors as well. When it comes to medical, we, we don't consider ourselves the experts. We definitely, we have a whole board of medical doctors on our team. And we definitely reach out to the doctors. I mean, you know how many times, you know, you, you'll get an email from one of us. And, and we ask, we, I think asking for advice and working with each other is really what sometimes sort of puts that puzzle together. So, do you have anything that you want to add on that? No, I think I can just basically echo what you said. So it really based, it goes based on, you know, obviously what the patient is all about. You know, sometimes someone is going to call me up and she'll say that she has this in this situation and she needs to go to a doctor and I'll find out whether or not she has insurance. And then I also try to find out, like, what type of person is she? Does she want to have someone who's going to hold her hand? Is she someone that has no problem going into an office, a big, like, let's say, for example, infertility, right? Or even high-risk pregnancies. Let's say this patient comes in, she's very, very needy. I will try to get her into a place that is going to, obviously, if it's possible, who's going to gear to her more, obviously, medically, and also emotionally. If she's going to be, if she's going to feel very uncomfortable going to a place that's huge, when she can go to a place that's a little smaller, and someone is going to always be there to answer her questions and the 15 times a day that she calls because she thinks that maybe she's not feeling well or something I'll go based on that obviously I will not ever do something compromise on medical right com- no, we exactly. don't compromise on medical care right. no but it's, it's personal you're trying you're, it's, it's you're trying to make a match it's the same thing you, you need right. it has to be a good you know it has to be a good match medically it has to be a good yeah. match personality wise and, and it's also uh, insurance you know, wise everything and go ahead no no what were you saying no, I was like, let's say, for example, if someone calls us up that she's pregnant with twins and they're sharing the sack or a placenta or both, I will try to send her to a place, for example, where we would not compromise on the medical care, but like we would know that the patient will now be able to go out of state for, let's say, if she needs to have a TTTS surgery and we will want her to have it out of state we will make sure that she's in a place that would send her out to that place versus doing it in-house because we like the out-of-state better. Or, for example, someone will call me and she's going to say, what do we do? You know, where do we go? Should we go to CHOP? And I'll ask her, which insurance do you have? And are you able to pay? Because if she can't pay, I can't send her to Florida because she's not ready to show $20,000 out of her pocket. Right. She has insurance and CHOP will pay for that. So a lot of it goes through, you know, medically, emotionally, and monetarily, because as you have said before, we can't financially pay for these things. Although I wish I had a tree in my backyard and I can just (laughs) take money for everything that people need. Just today, I was talking to someone who was telling me that she's pregnant with twins and she's, she's using a midwife. And I said, I really, really think that you need to get yourself to a higher place, someone who's pregnant with twins generally needs to be under high-risk gear. So she said, okay, where do I go? So my first question is, do you have insurance? And if you don't, can you pay for insurance? And she was like, I wish, I really, I can't pay insurance right now. I don't have the money. So obviously I'll have to think where I can send her without insurance. She's 19 weeks pregnant. Where am I sending her? Who's taking her in? So a lot, again, a lot of it is based on, you know, who the person is, what the situation is. What their circumstances are, what they can, what they can. And we also have to determine that without, sometimes it's what's not being said, you know, read between the lines and hear what the patient really needs, what do they want. Sometimes a, a situation will come up where after talking to the person long enough, 
I will have the courage and say, are you currently taking any medication? Are you currently under another doctor's care? That plays a huge role. You know, I, I, a patient is really seeing her psychiatrist and she's on medication and she's in the, the doctor in Cornell. And I will shift gears and say, okay, this is a little different than what I originally thought. But I think determining where the patient's coming from and all and the surrounding of what her situation is, is really what, what helps us guide the patient in the, in the right way. Have you found that people over time, because, you know, you've both been doing this for several years, do you think that in your community people are becoming more open to discussing all these issues, maybe not just with fertility, but about pregnancy loss and about uh, mental health and medications and, you know, because it so much is kept secret in the world. And a hundred percent. And have you, found, have you, have you found that that's, it's the same, it's changing. What has been no, your experience? It's definitely changing. In, in definitely, what way? What, yeah, and why is that? Do you think? Um, exposure. People see that it's, spoken about people will see advertisements they will see they will hear other people are more open to speaking about it because they hear other people speaking about it so for example I lost a pregnancy with twins at 23 and a half weeks you know that very well because you were the doctor there and knowing that people were there and afterwards being able to speak about it really really I would say 90% of my feeling better and how should I say it, my getting through it, your recovery, getting back myself and going through it was because I had a very, very strong support group with my parents, my family, my friends. It was, I think that a very big part of it was because I had a lot of support and being able to come out of it and, and being able to walk on the street and smiling and feeling happy for other people who did have kids while I didn't have and while I lost mine was because I had that much support. And then I would speak to someone who had a loss 30 years ago. She was seven weeks pregnant and she's still crying about it. I think she's still crying about it because she never cried for it when it actually happened. She either pushed it away she didn't talk about it because it wasn't something that you spoke about. It wasn't something that you discussed with other people. I think people see that you can speak to other people. And I think that really gives people the courage to stand up again and to feel better about themselves. And the more they, you know, the more support they have, the better chance they have of coming out of this in a better place rather than in a not such good place. I think that's amazing. And I do think that it's you know, when I look at, at your organization that, you know, that's so wonderful and people see the the ones who work with you, the sort of on the, the, the minute to minute things, what you do, you know, a couple calls, you hear them, you help them, you guide them, you get them through something, you help them get through something, which is amazing. And that's what you do, you know, all day, every day. But I'm also, you know, you take a step back and I just look at the organization in general and just this idea you know, and it's the same thing how it was founded, this idea that everybody goes through these things. So many people go through, you know, issues related to pregnancy, fertility, medical issues. It's so common. And the more that we're able to, you know, talk about it and open up about it and let others into our world, everyone benefits. People will get more care. They'll get better care. They won't feel stigmatized. They won't feel alone. And just that you guys exist and do this and are so comfortable with this and are so available, I think that just your presence is one of the reasons that this that this will continue to get better uh, over time. And so I, I applaud what you're doing. You know, I, I thank you guys. Obviously, we work together all the time, but we never I never really got to tell you, you know, all these wonderful things because usually, you know, I'm, I'm answering all your emails, but it's it's. It's it's just important work, and again, not just on the day to day, but just from a, a global perspective that you're there and what you all stand for. And I uh, I really I just tell one, one story. It's I had a I got a an email from Rabbi Unger. It was a, I don't remember a year ago, or whatever, and he was talking about a very very complicated situation, one of the most complicated situations probably I've ever heard from him about someone who's not yet married. And so it's a, it was a, it was a, you know, a girl, she was 18 years old and she had complicated problems and he was asking me about what can she do and this. And so I did some research and I said, okay, I'll meet with, with her. And so normally when that happens, you know, someone is going to come with her mother, maybe, you know, if she's married, maybe her husband, whoever. So mm-hmm. the, the people came to this meeting was the girl, her mother, 
her father, and Rabbi Unger. And the four of them sat across from me, and we spent an hour and a half together talking because Rabbi Unger didn't want to hear it secondhand. He wanted to be there and to understand and the family. And and that's the type of uh, people you are. And it was And you know, you know that the Pax just couple was, was flown in, meaning they're not people that live in the United yeah, States. Yeah, this is, this is, this yeah, is, right. un- this is so, unusual circumstances, right. but it's just, you know, that, right. that, you know, without your organization, they would have, the whole family have no idea what to do and where to turn. So what I want to say with this, with this is education. You asked us before, education and, and um, awareness, making, doing events in different communities and talking about it, talking about how mental, emotional health impacts a pregnancy. And you know, we do that. We, we speak about this a lot. So my biggest goal in this, in this thing is you know, preconception consultations right. versus the patient coming in and saying, oh, there's a problem. I have high blood pressure. I suffer right. from this. Right. I suffer from that medication. Meet to the doctor first. And we're very big advocates for that. Before you get pregnant, this is what we try to do in every community. You have a condition. You don't want to talk about it. No problem. But before you get pregnant, before we're in a situation, have a preconception consultation. Most likely it won't be a problem. But let's not wait to have to sometimes do a termination because of the mother's health. Right. So education is very big in every single type of medical condition, any any type of medical question, sometimes medical, sometimes it's emotional, whatever it is, be proactive. And, you know, so we don't run into situations. That's like a very big part of our edu- educating communities that it's OK if you don't want people to know. But at least if you're getting pregnant and you do have a medical condition, just have a preconception consultation. It'll it'll save a lot, a lot of problems. I agree. Absolutely. I mean, it's for for people with with you know, medical issues or whatever it might be, it's certainly better to plan in advance rather than to just say, hey, I'm pregnant, let's figure this out. And uh, right. and that's about, again, about people being able to step up and say, hey, I have this, I have a problem or I have an issue and to talk about it and then to get the help because it, it makes it better in the end. Thank you so much for coming on. You guys have a website. It's, you know, atime.org and people can find you and I hope they do. Uh, and I hope I'm increasing your call volume as much as I can. <laughs> and, uh, and I know that you know, people can you, know, you people can donate money to you guys. You know you're a, a nonprofit, and and you know it's a, you know I, it's it's an organization that should be supported. And I look forward to uh, working with you guys for many years to come. Sorry, mm-hmm. I just want to make one disclaimer before I before we put down the phone. So as I said, that you know having the support and knowing that you know you have who to speak to makes a very big difference. I just want to say that having you as an OB and as an MFM, I think also gives a lot of support to a patient knowing that they have who to speak to and they can trust the doctor and they know that the doctor knows what they're doing. That also gives the patient a lot of trust and a lot of confidence in knowing that they know they're in the right place and they know they're doing the right thing and they don't have to call us 15 times because they know that they're under good care. So that makes a very big difference. So thank you so much for being <laughs> Great at what you are. I think it really, you know, in the same way that we're supporting our patients and we're making our patients feel comfortable and happy, you really, you guys really do an amazing job being excellent OBs and MSMs. Oh, it's very sweet. And I will say that behind every great organization, there stand some great people, and you are part of that group of people who are there in our support when we need so we can help and pass on you know the information so we really thank you for all your time and all your effort and i know we sometimes harass you we email you we call you we drive it's all you crazy. out of love it's great yeah, but it really that's that's what makes us be able to do what we do so i want to thank you dr fox thank you and it's so been much. an honor <laughs> appreciate it thank you for listening to the healthful woman podcast to learn more about our podcast please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com that's H E A L T H F U L W O M A N dot com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.